you should see there we go it's loading a new set of slides okay tell me if you can't i don't see anyone complaining good and delphine's nodding my head <laughs> um good thank you delphine uh okay so over the next what do we now and next um half an hour uh, I'll tell you a little bit about fair sharing and what we do. Um, obviously, I'll be biased. Fair sharing is brilliant, but I'm the fair sharing coordinator, so I would say that. Um, a bit of kind of admin before we start, in a sense. Um, so, fair sharing, we're based at the Oxford e Research Centre in the Department of Engineering Science at the University of Oxford in the UK. As I've already mentioned, we're part of Susanna's data readiness group. You can see our little uh, URL there. Um, and we're, oops, hello. we're generously funded uh, by the Wellcome Trust uh, in the UK, as along with some other uh, European and American uh, funding from EOSC and uh, the NEH, among others. Uh, we're on Twitter, fairsharing underscore org, and you can contact us at any time on contact at fairsharing.org. So that's who we are. So over the next uh, yeah half an hour, I'll talk about FAIR very briefly, because I think most of you know the basics of what FAIR is. Um, and then I'll talk about how FAIR sharing can help. And then some of our work in the community, um, which I think is probably more relevant in the sense of making standards is all well and good, but it's building that community and meeting the right people and getting that adoption, which is key. So FAIR, findable, accessible, interoperable, reusable. There you go, it's a lovely acronym and it can help make your life better. So findable, it essentially means it's discoverable on the web, right? And one way to make sure it's discoverable is to stop changing its address. So use globally unique, resolvable and persistent identifiers. So you give it a permanent address on the internet, such as a digital object identifier. It's accessible. So you use clearly defined access and security protocols. So you know it doesn't have to be open, but there has to be a clear pathway to get to the data, even if that means you may have to pay or you may have to create a login and account, get permission in some way. Uh, that, that's fine. It just has to be accessible in some way. It has to be defined clearly. Interoperable, and this is key for that machine interoperability we're talking about machine actionable using community adopted standards so there's no point having um, a beautiful um, set of data with your own standard which is a slightly different version of someone else's standard so they can't get to all your data or they can't uh, actually get get your data to be interoperable with their data then that's not going to work that's not a standard that's your own personal fiefdom of data so you need community adopted standards uh, it should be linked with other resources should share data should reuse other people's standards don't automatically create your own and it's reusable so that means giving it a license uh, if you don't give something a license then even if you're saying oh it's open anyone can use it you need a license for them to be able to do so so they need to see that license so that includes giving the provenance for the data using community standards storing it appropriately um, not necessarily on your own computer but somewhere which will be persistent um, and obviously if something is not there it means you can't find it and you can't interoperate with it in any way so we all know there's um, data uh, often associated with publications which is not always well cited it's not stored appropriately data available on request it's not good if the email address that you have to email to doesn't doesn't exist any longer. Uh, particularly nowadays, with so much work um, involving software and code uh, and workflows, these are very hard to get to. There's very few places in which one can store them, and there's a few initiatives now that are trying to improve this. Um, often, uh, data databases and standards are poorly described for third-party reuse. Um, there's often there can be a different level of detail and annotation. So you, you perhaps have a wonderful set of data in a database and the part of the data that you're most interested in is beautifully described. But another part that you think is just pretty standard and nothing interesting about it, you've, you've just described very quickly and that part may be, may be more useful for other people. So you need to be consistent in your level of annotation. And all of these kind of extra tasks such as curation, reporting, and annotation are often perceived as time consuming 
and particularly if the data is associated with the publication. If your publication is accepted, great. Then uh, we don't need to do these things. It's time consuming. We'll, we'll do it later. And this is actually the key thing. If you want to allow your data or your standard or your resource in any form to be reused and cited by other people. So it really pays for you from a purely selfish standpoint to actually try and look after your, your resource and curate and annotate around it appropriately. And obviously, from a more altruistic angle, it's nice to share these things and nice to get the most value out of taxpayers' money uh, in many cases. Okay, so the FAIR principles, the whole point behind the FAIR principles is that they're built on providing... I have a question. Yep, yep go ahead. Yeah, so in the slide before, I was wondering, by a standard, you mean also the format of the raw data? Yes. Because it could be that you have a different formats for a machine that measure the same thing, but every machine has a different format of delivering the data. So how do you deal with that? You have to convert it to a standard? Or... So, I mean, this is where um, there needs to be kind of community action in, in a sense of, uh, you can have data available in different formats. That's perfectly fine as long as those formats are um, used by other people. So perhaps you have your data um, in a simple CSV file uh, that people can access, but then you also have it as, I don't know, RDF or XML. Mm -hmm. And you make sure you follow those standards um, without adding extra extensions on or other things like that, which allow people then to use your data depending on which standard they want to use. Yeah, I, I get that, but if the machine that delivers you the raw data half a standard, it's not CS, CSV or TXT, it's another one that is very weird. It's just particular from that machine. Um, then you have to translate it somehow to CSV using some software. To do that. Well, I guess if you want it to be um, interoperable, yeah, so the I in fair, then it needs to be in a format which is interoperable that other people use. So if it's kind of um, particular to that that machine yeah. or that brand of machine or whatever, then it's only able to be used by people who have that machine. Um, or who has a software that can interpret that. Format. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Now, if that's well used by people, uh, that software is available, even if people have to pay for it, maybe that's all you need. But if you want it to be used by by as many people as possible who you don't know, who don't have that software, then it would need to be translated into um, another another standard format. Okay, yeah, because this is a case of a lot of machines here in my in my department. Yeah, it's really common. It's really common, and that's what what is holding people back because you might have beautiful data, um, but other people can't get to it or don't even know it exists. Um, yeah, or no, it exists, but then can't use it properly. So yeah, okay, and this is something you. which I imagine Susanna will will uh, talk about tomorrow. But uh, since Susanna's online, Susanna, do you want to add anything to that? Yes, Peter was actually typing a little bit. Yes, I will. I will touch on the concept is uh, of uh, a standard being something that is used by more than one group. <laughs> and very simply say so. But obviously the formality of a standard, if the community is a grassroots or a standard organization, will make that standard even more proper and give them the authority. So I think this is the problem where people say this is a standard. At least a format has to be used by a group, by a community, and it, which is defined as a grassroots community, to be called standard. If it's something you only have, then it's not. Imagine you have a telephone. The telephone, if you don't have somebody else using a telephone, you can't communicate, you can't connect, you can't share information. So I think this is how we have to think. When Peter referred to standard, here we're talking about uh, formats. Uh, Peter will show the type of standard that are used by more than one group and they've been agreed to be the common way of sharing the information. Thank you. Okay, so, so as, I, as I was saying, that the FAIR principles are, are built on the idea of providing this um, metadata surrounding any digital object, data, standards, databases, repositories, policies, um, 
And the idea is with the FAIR principles, if you provide that metadata and those identifiers and, and so on, then you allow individuals, when they look at the data, to understand it, to place it into context. But you also allow machines uh, to do this. And that's arguably more valuable today when there's so much data, there's so many resources around. Um, it, it's better to be able to parse them in a machine actionable way. Um, and I mean, I, I won't go through this table. This is box two in the fair guiding, uh, the fair principles paper. Um, I have wherever there's papers like this, I have a link um, to the DOI of the paper. So when you look at the slides um, yourself, you can click on that link to take you through. I mean, a lot of these things where we're going to be mentioning, such as giving a DOI or a globally unique persistent identifier PID, giving rich metadata around it. Um, making sure you use vocabularies uh, to describe the data that other people use as Susanna was just saying uh, a standard is only a standard if many people are using it if it's a standard used by one a telephone that can't call anyone else it's not a standard it's not a telephone so ways in which you can help make your standard or repository or data policy fair um, so that other people can use it bit of repetition but findable Use PIDs, use, uh, if you have a website for it, use schema.org um, markup, which is a markup um, created by Google and Microsoft and Yahoo uh, to markup web pages um, with tags. So if, you're, if you go on Google and you search for a cooking recipe, um, I know you say I have, a, I have an aubergine, I have a courgette and I have some chicken, what can I cook? And then you get a list of recipes and they have little snippets, perhaps with some photos and things. Those snippets are provided by schema.org markup. Um, so that's a way to, to provide for you when you look at a recipe, the context of that recipe. You can make you know, a wonderful Thai curry uh, using those ingredients. Um, and so, so that's what uh, schema.org can do for you. You can add the metadata for your resource around um, uh, into fair sharing. Uh, accessible, define the level of openness, give it a license, interoperable, use community standards, uh, and reusable. Um, be very clear about what people can do with it. I see Mart has added, oh yeah, a comment about microscopes. Yes, uh, so I, in life sciences, almost every fancy equipment produces data in its own proprietary form. Yeah, um, yeah and this, this, is, this is a problem. I mean, you know, people have to make, make money out of their technology. Um, um, standards is, is a perfect example. Often people have to pay to use standards. It doesn't make them less fair, but it can be a barrier to interoperability for the data. Okay, so fair sharing. Oh, is there someone speaking? No? Okay. So fair sharing. Uh, if you want to know more about fair sharing directly, we have my mouse moves. Um, a link uh, to our latest paper. So if you went to fairsharing.org, uh, this would be the website that you see. This is our homepage. We've been going since 2011, which is nine years, my goodness. Um, I've been working on fair sharing since 2015, so five years. Uh, in the center of the page, you can see we have our search tools, which we'll be talking about later. A simple search and advanced search and a wizard but I want to draw your attention to the bottom of the page where you can see our standards databases and policies so you can see the number of um, uh, objects we have in fair sharing and how they can be split into different types of standards and different disciplines and subjects like natural sciences engineering sciences and so on um, so what we try and do in fair sharing is provide an informative and educational resource uh, and we do that by describing all of these standards uh, in a set of metadata. And we split the standards into five types. Formats, so models and formats. Um, an example from the life sciences would be the FASTA format for nucleotide sequences. Uh, another example would be JSON, um, which was also mentioned in, in the Slack. Uh, and then we have terminologies. These are controlled vocabularies, ontologies, the asauri. An example here would be the uh, Chester or Chester um, vocabulary for humanities or the gene ontology um, for uh, the life sciences. Reporting guidelines 
So these are minimum reporting guidelines or checklists. What is the minimum amount of information you need to surround an experimental data set, to place that data set into context that allows it to be interoperable? An example here would be uh, minimal or the ARRIVE guidelines for in vivo animal testing. And then identifiers, such as digital object identify DOI. These are identify schema that can provide a persistent identifier on the web along with some associated metadata to put that identifier into context and then metrics so these are criteria for the assessment of something such as the fair metrics now all of these standards we collect information about them and then we relate them to each other so you can argue that uh, a reporting guideline may stipulate the use of a particular format so if you want to report something, you need to report it in a certain format for it to follow those guidelines and so on and so forth. So that's what these little blue arrows indicate here. All of these standards relate to each other. We then relate them back to other records in fair sharing for repositories, databases and knowledge bases that would implement those standards. So you can start to ask and answer questions such as, I want to put my data into a repository for someone else to look at it for it to be available for everyone. My data is in this format. Which repository accepts this format? My data is in this subject. Which repositories accept data on this subject? Uh, and so on. So you can start to, to explore where you should put your data and what format or standard your data should follow in order to, um, to be able to, to go to that repository. We then link them back to data policies from funders, journals and other organisations that might endorse the use of a particular repository or standard. So you can see here, we could say a data policy endorses the use of Figshare, for example. Um, and that's great, but by doing so, they, imp they implicitly recommend the use of the standards that Figshare uses. And so you can start to follow through these two arrows, or very rarely they, um, they, they link directly to the standard itself. So you can see here we have this kind of triangle of relationships that we're trying to build up. And the aim here is to guide consumers, so the people who use these objects, to discover, select and, and use them with confidence. And the producers, the people who make standards, policies and repositories, uh, make their resources more visible, more fair, more widely adopted and cited so that other people can see and use them. So who is fair sharing for? So we have kind of six personas here. That won't be everyone, there will be others that we've missed. And if you think you're one that we've missed, do let us know. Um, so fair sharing is used by researchers, wherever they're from, academia, industry or government, um, when they're looking for standards for their data, they're doing a data management plan. Um, I see there's some things coming in the chat window, I'll, I'll deal with those uh, a little bit later. Um, so if you're doing a data management plan and you need to know what standards to use or where to put your data, you can use fair sharing for that. Um, if you have your own standards or, or repositories, you can add them to fair sharing and find out uh, what other people are doing and perhaps use the same standards, etc. If you're a research data facilitator, uh, steward and so on, you can use fair sharing to explore uh, your subject or subjects outside of your immediate domain to understand what's there so that you can advise people where they can put their data and what formats they should use. If you create policies, uh, then you can use fair sharing, as I'll show a little bit later, to um, define what should be in that policy and to make an assessment of which repositories and standards should be recommended by that policy. Um, there's also others such as uh, if you're in a learned society or association, you can do the same thing. You can create collections of resources uh, that I'll talk about later. Um, and before I move on, I see, uh, I will address some of the comments. So I see Susanna's address comment on RE3 data. Uh, yeah, this is, um, this is something that, that we've been very much interested in working with, with RE3 data. Um, for whatever reason, for many reasons, it's not happened yet. Um, but uh, this is this is something which yeah, many people ask us and ideally it would be sorted out but there's very little we can do if, if they don't want to work with us um, and then consumers yeah so I, I take the point and it depends on the, on your audience really people consume uh, the data so technically you could argue it's correct but it does sound kind of more marketing speak um, so consumers and users um, 
I, I agree and it depends on who you talk to so some of these personas for example uh the journal publishers the funders and data policy makers will talk about consumers um however if you're the developer of a standard or a researcher you're, then you're more likely to talk about users um yeah so it's uh, separated by a common language so talking about the type of data that we manually curate and that's something that i should have mentioned all the data in fair sharing is manually curated uh, by people like Delphine, uh, Alison and myself um, working together with the people who make those resources. So we allow people to claim a resource uh, record. So you work on the standard, you create the, the record for that standard, you can then update and edit that record. But anything you do is also reviewed by our curators to make sure it conforms to our curation guidelines and also um, that that it's accurate, that there's not been some misunderstandings and you're, you're relating your resource to something that shouldn't be, it shouldn't be related to. So here you probably can't see this if you have a small screen, there's a, a record, the top part of the record here, the chemistry vocabulary. Uh, you can see we have a number of controlled terms and text, but essentially we have about 45 metadata fields that we complete uh, for standards and databases and policies. Some of these are free text, so manually curated pros. Uh, some of these are identifier fields, like a URL for a homepage. Then we have ontology fields. These are using in-house ontologies that are interoperable with other ontologies, such as EDAM and um, Bro and so on, uh, where one can define the subject or domain. Uh, and also if you're in the life sciences, we use the NCBI, which is American uh, Taxonomy Speci uh, for Species ontology uh, and then we also have relationships between all of these resources uh, metrics such as if a resource is recommended um, support and um, contact information and then um, if there's a maintainer for that record and finally when a record is nicely stable and all the data is there we give it a citable doi that you can use so here's an example this is the open science framework osf uh, you can see this general information section at the top, some uh, identifier scheme, uh, identifiers here, uh, some of our ontologies, and then this has been recommended. You can see in the top right hand, there's a little ribbon, and this appears also in searches. So if you're searching and you see some resources have been recommended and others are not, that's one way in which you can assess whether you want to use a particular resource or not. Support section, emails, forums, online documentation, uh, whether there's any tools one can use, how you can access the data, if that's appropriate, search tools, the APIs, etc. And then relationships, so related databases, standards and policies. And then if a, an object has been recommended for use by a policy, those policies appear here. And then we have some kind of more admin time stamping. So here's a DOI, here's who maintains the record, here's when it was last updated for this particular example. So collections group together one or more type of resource by project or organization. So examples would be CDISC uh, for standards uh, in the life sciences, the Elixir Life Science Core Data Resources, or the National Transportation Data Preservation Network, which is a collection of standards. And then we have recommendations. So these are based on data policies, uh, mainly from journals and funders. So examples would be Elsevier, Springer Nature, or PLOS, for example. We have, I think, about 13 of those at the moment. Um, and each of our collection pages, again, has some handwritten prose at the top, various um, ontologies, terms that you can use to search and define. Uh, you can compare collections recommendations. So you can say, okay, I want, I'm funded by this funder and I want to publish in this journal. Where's the overlap? Which standards should I use? Which repositories should I use? Uh, you can also view this as a graph. What this means is you can see an interactive graph of all of the objects in that collection and how they relate to each other. And you can also move that one step out to say how they relate to other objects in fair sharing. So you can get this big network graph that you can start to move around to explore what you should, uh, wh wh which resources you should use. As another example, here's one from astronomy. You can see this is a collection of standards here. You can see different types of standards on the legend. Uh, you can see how they relate to all each other. Um, and this is a useful way um, to see visually very quickly 
um, whether a standard is well adopted or not by the number of relationships it has. Okay, oops, oops there we go. And so this interactive browser is quite useful if you're thinking um, as a policymaker, if you want to recommend the use of a particular um, standard or or repository or not. So here we have Holly Murray from F1000 Research, uses fair sharing, um, and she's used it to see. So the ones in green and orange here are the objects that they recommend to their users. So these are various model organism databases, but they all use in gray, uh, the gene ontology. Um, so that's not recommended currently by F1000, but it's used by all these resources that they do recommend. So that's one of these implicit recommendations. And so she can see that and go, okay, maybe I should recommend people use the gene ontology then, because clearly all the things I'm recommending use the gene ontology. Uh, so this is a way that you can use this to refine uh, policies. So conscious of time, uh, more than a registry are kind of, outreach more community style work um, where does the metagate metadata go so fair sharing content powers two semi-automatic fair evaluation tools the first is the fair evaluator here's the paper associated with that and this uses um criteria uh machine actionable criteria developed from the fair principles um by the authors of the fair principles and you can actually use this here if you click on that link it will take you through to the fair evaluator tool and this tool uses metadata from fair sharing to make an assessment of fairness and we have a similar arrangement here with this fair shape tool which is funded by the nih uh, there's the link to their tool um, and this allows you to assess the fairness of any digital object and obviously where that digital object is a database standard or policy it uses metadata from fair sharing and if you want to know more about these fair assessment tools there's many uh, coming up now there's almost their own ecosystem uh, you can go to our fairassist.org tool which is where we're just trying to collate all of these initiatives to map the landscape uh, where else does our metadata go? So there's data management planning. So there's the data stewardship wizard and the DMP online tool uh, that we're aware of. And we have integrated with the data stewardship wizard so they can use our metadata when people are selecting um, which resources to use. And with DMP online, um, we are currently working to, to integrate our data um, with their platform so that people can use our metadata to assess whether they want to use a particular standard or not. So we have a number of adopters and collaborators. Um, we're part, uh, thank you Martin, <laughs> we're part of the Research Data Alliance, the IDA, I'll talk about that shortly. We're recommended by a number of funders, uh, mainly within uh, the European Union, um, such as Horizon 2020. We work with a number of organisations such as Data Sites and the Centre of Open Science. Um, and we work with various journal publishers as well, which I'll talk about shortly. If you want to see more about the activities that we do, I think we're, we have listed on our activities table about 14 activities now. Uh, if you go to our fairsharing.org communities page, you can see these. Um, see here we have this uh, collaboration with data site collaboration with cos that I just mentioned the rda fair maturity model working group we're working with um and within the rda uh we have our own working group uh, which is now finished it's it's in maintenance mode if you know what that means um and we have two outputs from that registry for fair sharing and also a set of recommendations that people can use and from our rda work we've also started a new project to define the criteria by which um, journal publishers and funders can assess whether a data repository should be endorsed or not. Because what we've found, and I'll click through here so that you can read this, is that when uh, we put all of the data policies from journal publishers into fair sharing and then compare them by their recommendations, you can see some recommendations are similar, sometimes they've been inspired by each other, but sometimes they differ wildly and you say, well, why is that? Why does PLOS make a different judgment to Elsevier in terms of recommending which generalistic repository to use for your data? 
Um, and that's because it's down to individual choice by the people defining those policies. Perhaps they're not aware of some repositories or some of the things that those repositories do. And this kind of human error, if you, if you like, um, creates inconsistency and can be painful for authors. If you want to publish in a journal, it's rejected, you move to another publisher and you find you have to put your data somewhere else. So there must be a better way of doing this, more evidence-based, defensible way of doing this. And so what we're trying to do is guide journals and publishers to provide consistent recommendations where they should put, where, where people should put their data and reduce potential confusion as to what features make a good repository because there's a number of initiatives out there now such as Core Trust Seal, the Trust Principles, uh, the Elixir Core Data Resources and these uh, can be applicable to you, they may not be, but they all have slightly different variations on what is appropriate and so we want to map these and work with the journal publishers themselves to work out what they want, what they think um, and then we can start to build uh, a set of guidelines and then inform repository developers and managers to understand what um, these publishers think of as important so that they can meet those requirements in order to be endorsed and compare this to what other initiatives are going on and then ultimately because we want to be of service here that can drive curation and fair sharing so we can add extra metadata fields depending on what the publishers want. Uh, this has been going since 2018 um, and we're working um, on, on the third uh, iteration of these guidelines with the hope that we can publish, um, publish them uh, in autumn 2020. So another thing I want to talk about is this is a really good time to be talking to you all about fair sharing because we're currently undergoing a massive redesign of everything. <laughs> so that includes, if my mouse works, Hello. There we go. Okay. It's a complete bottom up approach. Um, so uh, we've redesigned our data model to make it more responsive. We've got a completely new code base from the bottom up. Everything is being recoded. Everything is being rethought, redesigned. We're adding new metadata fields, new search tools, such as an improved wizard tool. Um, and all of this, we have to have a minimum viable product. So not everything, but something that people can use by the end of 2020. So if today and tomorrow you're looking and you think, okay, this is great, but it would be better if it had X, Y, Z, then you can tell us um, and we can actually make some changes uh, for our new version uh, rather than we finish it and then you tell us and we have to redesign everything. Okay, so our team, other than the people who are on the call today, Susanna, myself, Alison and Delphine, we have a number of developers um, behind the project. These are the guys uh, led by Milo um, who are redesigning fair sharing. So Milo did the data model. Then we have um, Dom and Hossein who are doing our front end and Ramon who's helping with the data migration and Massey who's helping with the um, graphical um, representation of the resources that you saw there uh, and so I wanted to mention those so that they get the credit and I'll stop here to ask for more direct questions and also if you have any ideas now of what would be cool for fair sharing to have um, now would be a good time to let us know so either in the chat window or un -mic, uh, unmute your mic And I see uh, Susanna's already answered uh, a question of why we are redesigning it. No questions? That's amazing. Well, we'll move on then. People are probably in need of a break. So we'll have a coffee break. Um, I'm sure you've seen this already, but if you haven't and you're, you're happily caffeinated and ready to sit at your computer, you can watch this YouTube video um, about good data management, uh, which is always fun. And if you want to go back through the slides, um, I posted the link there again. Um, but I suggest since it's now 1.53 uh, according to, to me, I can share them because I say I will do it. Yeah. Uh, I suggest that we have a 10 minute break and come back maybe at just five past uh, two, uh, when we'll start talking about how to search fair sharing.
Okay, thank you. Okay, so now you should all be able to see the slide, how to search fairsharing.org. Um, shout up if you can't. Okay, so let's count the ways in which you can search on fair sharing. So everything you need to know about searching on fair sharing can be found in this blue nav bar style banner here. We have our search order of fair sharing, simple search, advanced search, and search wizard. The simple search is an elastic search. Um, and so what that does is it searches everything in fair sharing. And you can click to select if you want to only do certain registries within fair sharing, but it searches all records and searches all of the text in those records. So it's kind of a big blanket search, does everything. Um, it doesn't allow Boolean operators, so no ands or ors. And because it searches everything, it can give false positives. You know, maybe someone writes, we do not do this. And you're searching for this, and so it finds it. So, you know, this, this standard should not be used for, you know, in civil engineering. And you search for civil engineering on this simple search, it'll turn up and you won't know that it's actually a false positive. So in that sense, it's not very sophisticated. But it's a good way if you want to just start searching and see what's in there. And you can refine the search as you go using our faceted search, which I'll mention a bit later. We then have our advanced search, which, as it says on the tin here, fine grain control over your search. So this is a little bit small, actually, on, on my screen. I should have made the screenshot a bit bigger. But this allows you to, to select various fields and types of fields to do more targeted searching. It also allows combinatorial searching in that you can combine two fields. So you could say, I want to know everything uh, in engineering, with a particular open license. And so you can do that combinatorial search. Um, because it allows more fine grained searching, sometimes it can result in missed hits um, if you're too specific. So perhaps you choose um, a vocabulary term which is more specific uh, than perhaps you need. And so you can miss some of those uh, objects which have been annotated with with a less specific term. And it doesn't yet allow Boolean searches other than the and, but we hope in the next iteration of fair sharing we'll be able to allow you to pick and choose um, the fields here and then go, I want this, but not this, all this, etc. So that's something that should be coming by the end of the year. So this faceted searching, this is what you get whenever you get a hit list. So if you did a simple search on fair sharing using the, the main search box uh, and you've got you know, hundreds of hits that's okay you can then refine them using this faceted searching so here you can see you can select to say i only want those that have been recommended by a journal publisher i only want those which have a publication associated with them or that the record in fair sharing is maintained uh, by someone you can also see here we have the record status, which I haven't mentioned yet. And this is where uh, for every record in fair sharing, you can say whether the resource associated with that record is ready for use. So this standard um, is finished, it's adopted by the community, you can use it. Or it's in development. So as on the Slack, um, you're creating a standard. Uh, it's not quite finished, you're still figuring out how to get other people to adopt it. Register it in fair sharing with an in development um, status. And that way, uh, other people can see that it exists. It's some way you can point people towards with all the metadata. When people are searching, they can see it and go, okay, you're developing that standard. Maybe I can get in touch with you to find out more. Sometimes, of course, um, particularly uh, terminologies, control vocabularies, they can be deprecated as they're subsumed uh, or superseded by another ontology and so some of these can have the tag uh, deprecated and where that happens we say okay this record is deprecated because the resource is no longer recommended that you use them however that's because this has happened this person told us this on this date you should actually try this other resource instead so we don't just leave you hanging we say okay if you were using this control vocabulary term uh, uh, resource that has now been deprecated that's fine instead you should use this other one and where we've um, tried to contact the owners of a resource and we think maybe that it's no longer ready for use uh, 
try to contact them, they're not responding, the URLs don't work, then we go, okay, it's uncertain. We don't know. This is kind of saying, look, we know this exists, but you use it at your own risk. We don't know if it's still ready for use or not. And we don't have many of those, but I just wanted to mention that there. If you were to scroll down the faster search list, you could see, okay, see Alison's answering question. You can see uh, taxonomies, countries, organizations. You can start to select through those. So if your list of hundreds, you can say, I only want those um, from the European Bioinformatics Institute for example, for whatever reason. And I only want those um, for this particular species. So you can start to refine through as you go. So you can see here uh, in the hit list, we show you the registry that it comes from, the name, the abbreviation, the type of object it is, and then various other bits of information such as what standards or databases it's related to, and what subjects and domains uh, it's appropriate for. Okay, now before I go to the live demonstration, uh, I see there was a question 